Joining me on the podcast today is Liam Messam. Liam with uh, 21 caps for the All Blacks and a massive 179 caps for the Chiefs. Liam, thanks for uh, jumping on the call coming from the south of France, mate. How's, how's things? Yeah, no, nah, it's going good, bro. It's, uh, thanks for the, uh, the offer to come onto your podcast. But uh, yeah, just locked up here in the south of France. Not the worst place in the world to be locked in, uh, in isolation. So just trying to, trying to keep my sanity going. Yeah, well, definitely made a little bit easier. At least you're not stuck in the UK. Probably crammed up in a little two-bedroom apartment or something, eh? That's yeah, that is true. It's a uh, it's beautiful part of the world. Everyone looks it up. You showed me where his sport is, and it's unbelievable. Um, mate, just want to talk today about uh, you know Dave Rennie and um, the influence he had. I suppose mainly Dave Rennie, but not necessarily just Dave Rennie. This is about um, you know about leadership and, and creating a high-performance culture and whatnot. But uh, it was pretty interesting. I was doing a little bit of research this morning and the Chiefs had come second in 2019 with, uh, 2009, beating convincingly by the Bulls over there, which was oh, that's a tough spot to go to. Um, yep. And then 11th and, and 10th in uh, 2010, 2011. And then Dave Rennie comes in his first year. And like you'd had a pretty, pretty you know, well-renowned re- coach there, Ian Foster. What does Dave Rennie bring to the table in 2012? Yeah, it's a good question, mate, because um, like I look back now and you look at those teams in 2010 and 11, and they're probably more talented than they were in 2012, 13 and 14. Um, but when Renz turned up, he um, he just really bought a... Um, it's not that we didn't work hard in those early years, but he really actually bought like a, a really tough work ethic and everybody um, working hard. And his whole mantra was like... Um, good working hard bastards and that's what he wanted so if you look at the team like now you have these players are big superstars and they're really good but back then they were just young kids but just really good working hard young fellas and he was really big on on everyone pitching in and doing their part but he was also really big on connections and understanding where you came from and who you represented in in the the um the, the the region so I think I'd been in the Chiefs for six or seven years by then but I really didn't understand like I was proud to be a Chief and still am but back then, I didn't really understand what the area was and what it meant to be playing at our stadium. So, like, our stadium that we play in Waikato is, um, is an old pass site. It's an old um, marae ground, old um, battleground for the old Warriors back in the day. And, like, man, we didn't know that. And then there's carvings in the stadium um, that represents those meanings and how sacred that land is and how powerful our Chiefs area is. Um, so, just connecting to that... Um, like they played a massive difference. So we started playing for something bigger than 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 just ourselves, and we started playing for for the region and for well, what I guess everyone calls Chiefs Chiefs money now. Yeah, so talk, that's an interesting one. Um, ten, so it gave you a real purpose more than just your own personal uh, achievement. The Chiefs money. I I I witnessed that. You know, when I went over there to play with the Steamers in 2013, and like yeah, heard a lot about this and see a lot about this. What is that and how did that get brought in? Yeah, well, it, it all came about, frick, I'm, not, I'm not sure what year it was, maybe 2009 or 10 um, with a good friend of mine, uh, Sione Lawaki, and we are just at home um, just drinking kava and the boys were having a few beers. Um, we were just talking and then we just came up with the word Chief's Mana, but just more of a, a I wouldn't say a gang thing, but like just more of a, you know, a boys thing. We just say to each other, yeah, Chief's Mana, and like we'll get on the field and be like, yeah, Chief's Mana, let's go. And then it sort of just grew from that. And every year we just started adding to it, adding to it. And then it got to probably, yeah, probably 2012, actually, we um, actually put some like real meaning behind it and some depth behind it. Um, yep. And at the Chiefs, we know the logo is, is the, the Chief, but it's got no legs. Yep. So that year we really we really wanted to put legs on, on, on that emblem and something that we could stand on and something we could be proud of. And it just grew from there and it, it's just, like there's two sides to the Chiefs Mana. There's the side that's uh, on field, yep. which is um, we're brutal, we're physical, we're ruthless, we're relentless, um, we're skillful, um, we never give in, and we always have each other's back. And then there's the off field Chiefs Mana, where it's um, you know community driven, looking after our people, looking after our family, um, making sure we're going not just through the the good times, but going through the tough times with our with our boys and our team, and, and also our community. Um, but making sure it's real, real genuine. And what um, Ren's done really well is like he had a group of um, coaches around him and he's, he's surrounded himself with real 
real real good people as well and really knowledgeable people and with uh, a lot of respect and a lot of mana um to to drive that so we had like we had Wayne Smith we had um Tom Coventry Andrew Strawbridge Carl Hoft and all them so we had guy here guys around them to to really drive that and that just filtered in with um especially with us older guys um as you know being in a in a footy system it's just a filter just keeps mm-hmm. going and you just keep filtering into the younger players and it just grew from there to to what it is today so um Yes, it's, it's, it's turned into a very powerful thing for the Chiefs and um, it's really big because we play for something bigger than ourselves and, and if you can do that as a team, then, man, you know, you can you can achieve anything. Quite powerful. Okay, you, he brings in a sense of purpose, but uh, what exactly, like, you know, okay, you've got this good culture and whatnot, but how do you go from 11th to, or 10th in 2011 to 1st? What... What changes, not only like obviously you start playing for each other, but what else happens to actually ensure that that turns into success? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, like I said, we were so t- we were talented all those Chiefs years and Fozzie done a great job with, with the team and with the boys. Um, we still had that real close family feeling. Um, they, would, they would never change at the Chiefs. Um, that's always been there since day dot. Um, but when we came into 12, uh, 2012, everyone really... Like, they were long days, don't get me wrong. Yeah, were um, they? Longer stuff, yeah. Like, I'll, being the captain um, for those years, I'll be in, I'll be the first one in the dawn, like, generally the last one out, so I'll be get there, like, sometimes 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't get home until 5, five 6 o'clock at night, bro. So, yep. um, but Renzo was really big on making sure everyone knew their role. Um, it was the first time ever in our preseason that I've done. So we all know what preseason is. You just run, you get flogged, and you just yep. do weights and get smashed. But we actually done skills like just proper. We break every skill down. We break down every sort of running line for each sort of phase move that we had. So everyone had to learn that. But it was awesome. Like I've never done that. I've never experienced that before. I mean, we just we just honed that. We just drilled that. We we still got smashed and still done our running. But in between, he was just chucking drills and made, making sure everyone knew and understood the game and then the biggest thing is um, probably maybe the mental shift um, like there's a lot of sitting down a lot of meetings a lot of video work a lot of guys understanding and um, knowing their roles like I said but just understanding the game and understanding the pressures in the game and, and what you'll go through um, but sometimes reviews will take for an hour and a half two hours like wow. that's a long day and he, and he was really good by, the coaches were real good by breaking it up and doing it different. Like sometimes you go away in small groups or sometimes you go away um, in bigger groups and you just discuss and talk and, um, you, you've said and do little things like that. The, um, the importance of everyone knowing their role. Uh, for those that are listening, that might seem pretty obvious, uh, you know, with a rugby team. What do you mean by that? Like, well, you think it's pretty obvious. But as we both know, bro, you go into teams and you go over moves. Like, I'll take this place, for example, here in Toulon. It's a long, long season. We're into, we're like, week 30-something. And we're still talking to the, like, about the same moves and where people should be and what you should be doing, bro. And I'm just like, so, yeah, it sounds simple and basic. But I don't know what it is. It's just um, sometimes people in the heat of the moment, especially rugby, bro, you've got all these different pressures coming at you, physical pressure, mental pressure, um, and people just, I don't know, switch off. I don't know what it is. And, um, rugby's, uh, especially at, at that elite level, is, is a lot different to, like, say, club rugby or something. Like, I love playing club because you can just go out there and, you know, you've got no yeah. position where you're supposed to be. You can just go out there and um, express yourself, have fun. You can still do it at elite level, but it's... Uh, it's a lot harder to crack defences these days because it's such a defence-oriented yeah. game. So, um, yeah, you <laughs> think you want to know their role. Yeah. But I would make sure. And the best thing about that too, bro, and, and the Chiefs that year and, and when Renz came in, that everyone was, was accountable for their action. So, we, like, you'd get called out. If you didn't know your role, if you didn't know what was going on, you'd get called out in front of the group. So you made sure you, you knew your role. And um, books were a big thing. Everyone used to write down their, their notes and their role. Um, and now I think about it, I think back in the, the early, my earlier Chiefs year, we didn't have that sort of accountability or we were just like, oh, no, nah, he'll be right, he'll, he'll get it. Or, um, but we really drove that in 2012 and 13, especially. Yeah, I interviewed Lottie Dekiri on Saturday, two days ago, and he was saying the same thing, obviously. 
there with the Broncos and over at Leicester and, and um, there with the Bunnies and you're saying just honesty and accountability and just you've got to hold each other, you know, call each other out on that. So that's interesting. And um, the know your role too, I talk a lot about ensuring everyone, especially, it's probably easier in the rugby world than the business and corporate role where clarity leads to confidence. When everyone is clear on what they've got to do, bang, they just go and get it done. And especially when you've got that, that accountability. So that's, uh, it's interesting that you've mentioned that a good few times because as I said, it would seem straightforward, but it's not always the case. Um, you, you talked there about dual captains, or no, you didn't say dual captains, but the dual captains, why the dual captaincy? Mate, it was uh, worked out a treat. Like, um, I think it was the first time a professional rugby side had, had tried that, um, the dual captaincy. Um, and I joke quite a bit because uh, I just like I'm quite a fiery player. I get quite passionate, um, and the way I speak to the refs, so it, was, it was quite good to have Craig Clark there. So we were sort of like the, um, the we we're total opposite as leaders, I guess. Um, he was he had a real calm influence on the group because um, he's a real thinker. He um, like you ask him a question, he'll take a good good minute to think about it, then he'll, he'll answer you. Um, but where I'm the other thing, where you ask me a question or something, I'm sort of the, the motivational guy. I'll get everyone up and be the sort of, um, I guess, the voice for the boys, and he would be the, the calming voice and ca- calm everyone. And he's really good at inter- um, interacting with referees and talking uh, with people like that. So it worked really well because we're the, the, the total opposites. What um, What about when it comes to tough decisions there? Um, yeah, I'd say... I always think that like, AFL has a lot of, they love their co-captains, but in rugby, like you've got so many other um, tough decisions to make as a captain where you, know, you might get a penalty and do you go for a scrum? Do you kick for the corner? Do you go for goal? Quick tap. How do you come to those decisions? Yeah, well, well we sort of saw that the Chiefs, the captain was the only one that done the coin toss and spoke to the media at the end of the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and yeah, the captains might get a bit of credit, but it's the, the group, Collectively, that we had, like, we had a really, really strong leadership group. Um, like, was that a, an official leadership group where they'd actually been elected? Or, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So, we had an official leadership group. Um, we had guys that looked after certain parts of the field or certain roles on the field. Um, and so, you just have full faith in them to, to make the decisions. So, like, Craig Cark looked after the line out. I looked after the attack, um, the attack, the defense. Um, Aaron Cruden looked after the, the attack with another back and Sam Kane looked after the breakdown or whatever. So um, we, had, we, had, we had such a strong group like that. And like I said, the captain's just there just to, to flip the coin, bro, and, and to um, talk to the media at the end of the game. And um, if a decision on the field is a real tough one, we'll just come together collectively, take a deep breath, and then we all got, we all got a good feel for each other. And then... Most of the time you listen to Cruz because he's the game driver and he's got such a great knowledge of the game and knows what's, what's to do. So we just agree on that and then we go through it and we just yeah, have each other's back on whatever decision's been made. Might be the wrong decision, might be the right decision. As long as, as everyone's backed it, then we just went for it. Yeah, right. I like that. That's a bloody good point. Uh, so your first game there under um, Dave, uh, lose round one of the Blues. Then you go on to an unbelievable winning streak of nine games, including, I think, the Force, the Cheetahs and the Sharks, all consecutively, all on the road. Um, and you actually lose to uh, the Reds, the defending champions, uh, which sort of halted a bit of momentum there. What was said, is there anything said in the change room after that? No, it's like the, the Reds have always been our bogey team. You know, everyone's got that one bogey team. It's all <laughs> for us. It's always the too. Reds, bro. I'm just like, fuck, it's never like, I can never beat the Reds. It's just always the Reds, no matter what their season was. Like, they could be champions or have a, a bad year. They'll always get one over us. So, um, oh, man, it's never an uh, easy, easy road. Um, we knew there was going to be ups and downs and struggles, um, but we just, uh, we worked so, so hard on our mental side of the game too and the, and the pressure side of things. And we've got our own um, sports psychologist, David Galbraith, and he's done a fantastic job with the leaders and with everybody to understand that, yeah, there's going to be moments in the season that, like, we don't need to hit the panic button. It's um, a great opportunity. Like, we had a real great growth mindset um, yep. in those years. So we knew, oh, yeah, if this, if this happened, then we'll just learn from it and grow from it. We wouldn't panic and, and start freaking out like some people do or some teams do. Um, we, just know, we just knew where to get back to what, well, it worked for us. Yeah, love it. 
Love it. So very beneficial then having a psychologist in there? Oh, 100%. Like, um, yeah, like I said, people think rugby, you just go out there and play the game. And, but at an elite level, you, there's the ones with the cool heads that can go out there and do their job under pressure are the, are the good ones, the great ones, and the great ones that can do it again and again and again and again. So look at a guy yeah. like Richie McCall. Like, man. He's just so mentally tough, bro. Like he could, people could bite him, kick him, punch him, whatever, and he'd just look at you and just carry on running and just keep doing his job and just make decisions on the spot just like that without getting flustered or out getting... You know. um, you guys go through, so you have the first week off and you actually come up against the Crusaders there in the second week, which is a pretty, it was a pretty good game, actually. I remember that, and I think you win 20-18. Um, come to the final, but you absolutely destroy the Sharks. What's the... The mentality going into that game. Okay, I can't remember what the score was, but I think it was thirty-eight, wasn't it? Did yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I just knew that from, you know, they say you got to lose a championship to win a championship, and you brought up that two thousand and and was it ten or whatever. I remember. Yeah. I remember that. I remember every single minute. I remember. I remember we kicking off to the Bulls in the second half, and Bucky's ball was at the front of the mall, and they more like sixty meters almost to our yeah, try line, bro, and just yeah. like. He's just shaking his head, frothing from the mouth. Um, so I just made sure, like, our boys didn't um, not get lost in the moment, but just really took the moment and, and took it with both hands. And I go back to that Chiefs money, and we were playing for something bigger than a championship. We were playing something bigger than ourselves. And that's what really drove us, and that's what really, I believe, got us over for those two years, is that we, we played for something bigger and deeper than, than winning a championship. We all wanted to win a championship. They, they're like, don't get me wrong, like, we're all competitive, and that was, like, all our goal was to, to win win the championship, but we we're playing for something bigger and deeper and then to enhance that Chiefs man and to make it more powerful, we knew that a championship would do that. So but we just all got on that we just got all got on that wagon and we just put our head down, worked hard and um and we just enjoyed the moment um of playing in front of our home fans. It was the week before we sold out against the Crusaders and that um feeling was awesome and we just got to the final and the same thing, sold out crowd in Hamilton and boys just just went, went for it. Blitzton, Blitzton. I think we had like, um, oh, they say defence is all about attitude and you can tell um, people's defence by the attitude. I think in the semi, I think our tackle percentage was like 98% or something stupid like yeah, that. And wow. I think the final was like 99. I think we missed like two two tackles, uh, two or three tackles from the semi-final to the final. So the boys were definitely <laughs> engaged and, and switched on. Yeah, that's impressive. That's a, it's a really interesting point that leads into the next one, actually. So, you, you know, I think, um, I think that was probably one of the issues there with the Reds is it sort of, they, you know, it turns around pretty quickly and, and fifth missed out on the finals when it was a four team and then won it and then sort of almost took it a little bit for granted. Um, 2013, you, you're defending champions. You're, you know, you, you want to, yeah, back that up. And Phil Jackson, you're a big basketball man. The, um, in his book, The Eleven Rings, there talks about how hard the second year always is because it turns from this mindset of it's a, it's a, it's a me, not a we anymore. How do you ensure that that doesn't creep in in the second year? Yeah, like I said, because we had such strong values and standards about accountability and and making sure everyone's clear and, and knowing their role and whatnot and knowing what it meant to be a chief. So if you came in, um, you know, most teams you come in every year and you sit down and you write out what you want for your year and you write your goals, whatever. If you came into the Chiefs that year or even from now, they still do it. You come in and, and this is what it means to be a chief and this is what Chiefs Manners is. And we live by that every every day. And they, you know, everyone talks about the, the Patriots and the Patriots way. I guess it's sort of that sort of mould as well. Like it's like the Chiefs way and it's the, the um, Chiefs Mano way. Um, and we're, we're, that year, everyone was so hungry to, to get a double again because it's um, like doing it back to back is, is pretty special and, and um, not many teams have done it. So we just, yeah, we same thing. We just put our head down. We just worked hard for each other. Um, we kept each other accountable, lived to the, the standards and values of, um, of Chiefs Mano. Um, and we were, yeah, we worked hard enough to, to come away with another championship. We thought we weren't going to get there because the Brumbies were absolutely smoking us at the, oh, the yeah. final for about 60 minutes. I'll, I'll um, get to that. But so are your values, like, are they written down and clearly defined? No. So, so what, what we wanted to do um, as a leadership group is we didn't want to have just words up in the wall because every team's been in 
everyone's been in teams where there's just words up on the wall and uh, you know words are words bro like yeah. you've got to action like I've had I've been fortunate enough to have leaders during my career that are just all about action you know um, they have big presence about them and um, so that's that's what we just done and we just we had we had the keywords uh, but yep. we made sure that everyone understood them and we made sure that especially as leaders that we lived them every day um, so, so you're calling time, each other out on that like the, and, and is that more yep. because I've again I've seen that where the leaders will sort of call out the younger guys but they don't call out the other yep. no everyone, everyone is on the, everyone's on the same page bro and um yeah, like you said, like not many guys would call me out, but we'd have guys on the team that would call me out, bro, and it's like, oh shit, that's pretty mean. Like that's that's, that's real powerful with uh, um, a younger player or um, someone that's not seen as a, in the leadership group calls one of the leaders out. You know what I mean? Um, but then that's also the um, oh, I love it. Like that's also the the what's the word? Yeah, um, a bit of trust there and humility, I suppose, isn't it? Like. Like you, yep. like you know. It, otherwise, a young bloke calls out an older bloke, and they turn around and whack him and say, "Shut up! Don't tell me what to do." Who, yeah. who do you think you are? So then that person's never going to do it again. Yeah, yeah. So now we 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 made sure, especially as leaders, that we led and lived the values and standards each and every day, so we wouldn't get caught out. If you knew what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. I like I, I would pride, I pride myself on living those values and standards every day, um, twenty four seven, and I made sure for me that I was like the hardest working bloke in the gym, the hardest working bloke on the field, that I lived um, Chiefs manner every day. So um, I gave no one the opportunity to call me up. Um, I got called out a couple of times from old lats from Tony the Latimer. Yeah, the that that would actually, that. yeah, he was probably the only one that actually called me out on on genuine stuff, like especially on on the footy field. If like yeah. something would happen, like I'll be. I know, miss a tackle or something, and I'll start walking, and then he'll just rip into me in front of the boys, and the boys are like, oh, shit, let's go. So then, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, for I just me, make sure that I live those those standards every day, bro. The, for me, Tanner Latimer is probably one of the um, best examples of a proper chief, like just old school, yep, 100%, wise, you know, yeah, do as I come with me, but I will call you out. And yeah. and no BS was he either. like what is it? and I loved him I played against him in schoolboys and then played with him at the bay but who are some other leaders in there and what you know even Sonny Bill sort of thing and um, you talked about Sione Lawaki before obviously he he wasn't there then but yeah some of the other guys there at the Chiefs that had different attributes I suppose leadership qualities yeah so I guess the, the the root of it all is like guys like John O'Gibbs, Stephen Bates, um, when I was playing, yep. um, Sione Lawaki, Mills Molina, those, Stephen Donald, those guys sort of set the, the foundations of, of Chiefs Mana. And then the, when we added our, I guess, our, our um, flavour to it, we had obviously guys like Craig Clark, which is awesome, Aaron Cruden, who's just, man, his, his rugby brain and just his calmness to a team is awesome. Yeah, um, he's calmness. Then you got, yeah, he's bros. He does lose his rag now and then, but yep. as you do. Um, um, to, uh, TKB, Tawara Kubalu, yep. he's really big on clarity, making sure everybody knew their role. Like sometimes we'll spend an extra 30 minutes outside on a Thursday after training, just making sure that everyone knew their role on defense, who took who on what. Um, so he was really good for that, making sure everyone, and he was really, really demanding, as most nines are. It can be a little bit of, a little of a shit now and then, but you know what nines are like. Yep. Um, and then obviously guys like Sonny when he was there because of the way that he just holds himself and the way he trains, um, like a lot of people looked up to that. Uh, Lilia Masanga was really big for the, the team culture. Yeah, right. I would have um, picked that. Why, what, there's, what most, there's most guys that are jokers or clowns on the team and he, he's the joker and clown and yeah. he'd make sure there'd, there'd be a laugh around and, and joke around a bit. Um, so that's the other thing in those years that we got right. Where we worked really, really hard, but we had so much fun off the field too. But yeah. I think some teams get it mixed around. Some teams work really, really hard but don't have fun, or some teams just have way too much fun and don't work really hard. And yeah, we just we had hard. that we had that right we had it we had that combination right of working our busting our ass off every day, I'm um, enjoying each other's company, but then also having a lot of fun off the field. And Masanga played a big part in that. Um, yeah, everyone had their their part in in those two years. Um, Tim Nana Williams again, like especially yeah. the guys who are underneath the leadership guys. Yep. Um, especially guys like Tim, um, Sunny, Lelia, because we've got a lot of Pacific Islanders and, and Maldives on the team, they looked up to those guys and those guys mm. were lead by 
by example, they wouldn't say much as it's not in, I guess, in their personalities to speak up or not, but they would just, just do their leading by action. So our Pacific Island boys would look up to those, those blokes and, and get real, um, I guess, strength from that. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, you talked a little bit about the final there. Let's go into a bit more of that. The Brumbies are leading 16 nine and a half time. One of the best games of Super Rugby going around. Um, what set at the half time there? Oh, to be honest, I'm, I think I went in and like, you know, I said everyone keeps cool and keeps calm, but I think well, there's a point in time where you can lose your shit. And I think I went in there and I think Rens lost his shit too and I think I lost my shit because we were just getting beaten up. Like rugby's a basic game, but he's got to win the physical battles and you're halfway there. And the yeah. Brumbies are just beating us up everywhere around the breakdown. George Smith was just being a pain in the ass yeah, like yeah. he always is over the ball. And um, they, were, they, they were just killing us. And um, we knew we had it in us. We just had to flip the switch and change it mentally to just get back in the game. I don't really exactly know what's been said, <laughs> but yeah, I think a few of us just lost our shit. Then we re-clicked um, clicked it as a group and just went out there and... Um, to slowly grind it away. We knew we could work through it. We knew they'd been to Africa, was it twice, maybe? Yeah, uh, no, so they played, I back. think, the Cheetahs at home. Then they had that unbelievable Yeah, so they travelled to the Bulls. the Bulls, which yeah. is, as you know, bro, it's tough oh. at the high valley, and then had to come back to Hamilton. So we knew that if we could keep in the fight and just keep swinging and just don't stop swinging, we knew someone was going to um, give up, and we just made sure that we were the ones that were kept sw- swinging at the end. Yeah, because it gets it gets um, worse before it gets better. You find yourself, yeah, twenty two twelve there uh, with after sixty minutes. What's the vibe out there then? And uh, interesting, I think that then um, you know the coaching staff bring on a fair few of the fresh reserves too, which looks like it changed a bit of momentum. But Ian, you know, what are you saying out there? Like, in you're one of the co captains. What? Yeah. To make sure that it, yeah, was, it hasn't changed after half time, really. Like you actually have said, it's you, you, yeah, you've let in a few more points. Yeah, well, um, I think the Brumbies early on the second half started getting the momentum, and they, um, Rathbone made a, a line mm. break or something, and one of the boys made a desperate tackle right at the end to, to stop him out, and then they kept going for the line, keep going for the line. Um, and we defended really, really well. And I think that sort of just gave us the confidence. And then we started to slowly gain momentum, slowly gain momentum. And us leaders, we knew that if we kept getting momentum, that they're going to break um, just because we knew our spirit and the, the mindset of our team. And once we started getting on top of them, and then um, I guess, like I said, me and Craig Clark and the other boys were, because me and Craig Clark are so separate, uh, different, I was like yelling at the boys, just getting them up, geeing them up, geeing them up. And then Craig Clark will be the, the calming influence and then Cruds will be just doing his thing on the sideline and then our, our bench our bench actually won us that game because um, we had such a strong squad that year we had guys we had like Bundy Aki came off the bench um, Augustine Paulu um, oh, yeah. Sam Kane came off the bench like we had, bro, we had guys that were like unbelievable um, impact players that just came and just flipped the switch and brought the energy and, and lifted everything yeah nice nice um, what what can the Wallabies expect or Australians expect from Dave Rennie. I've got to hear, I think it was on one of the New Zealand websites. It might have even been on the All Blacks website, but uh, Rennie has been described as a hard nose, doesn't tolerate fools, is astute and has a deep rugby intelligence. What uh, you said before we actually started recording that he's the best coach that you've ever had. Why? Yeah, well, he's, he gets the best out of you. So when I say he's the best coach I've ever had, he's at the best, him and Wayne Smith are the, are the two coaches that I really look up to. And I've had some, bro, I've had some awesome coaches in my career. Like I look back now, I had Ian Foster for a very long time, um, John Mitchell, Warren Gatlin, um, Steve Hansen, um, Ted, Graham Henry. So I've yep. been very fortunate to have all these awesome coaches in my career. Um, but one of the thing I love about um, Renz and Smithy was that, um, Oh, just the, you know, just that personal connection that he has with everybody. But it's not just me because I was the captain. He had that connection with everybody. Like, he'll be the, the first one to hand out a, a beer after the game, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. Um, right. You know, the professional era is like, now everyone, you get the first thing you have to have is a Powerade and a protein shake. And Renz is standing there with a box just like, you know, like he doesn't mind, I'm not saying he's a, he's a big drinker, but he doesn't mind having a beer. He loves getting the guitar out and he loves to sing and, 
he loves he just knows that culture and belonging plays a real massive part in team success um yeah. and i think that just renders the person he just loves that and he loves working hard like i said in there and he, he just takes no bullshit um and he'll, he'll make he'll make you work and he'll make you learn he'll make you grow um but then he also will make you understand and have a sense of belonging um and connection to where you come from and who you play for um and what he's done at the chiefs i've what i've heard from in glasgow he's done the exact same thing there he's same thing, he's made those boys understand their connections and where they come from and who they're playing for. Um, so with the Wallabies, um, yeah, all I can see him is doing exactly like the same thing. And um, Australia always got the talent, so um, that's not going to be an issue for him. So um, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing where he can take that that team, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, I'm not, because I'm bloody excited. What, what, <laughs> what about Wayne Smith? A uh, lot about Wayne Smith. Well, yeah, well, give us an insight. The goat, mate. He's the goat. Everyone's talking about the goat at the moment with Michael Jordan and LeBron James. Wayne Smith is the absolute goat to me. In, in terms of what his tactical, tactical is, um, bro. Everything. This is everything about the game. He's just like the genuine professor. The um bloody sensei, whatever they are, you yeah, know, he's just like, know. and he just gets the best out of everybody and he keeps everybody accountable. It doesn't matter how many games you've played. If you're a day one person or year 10, like I was, or whatever, he just, um, he just gets the best out of you. And the same thing. The best thing is about both those guys is they're um, awesome coaches, but better blokes off the field. Mm. Um, just like, there's not many coaches or many people you can say, oh, let's go out for a coffee and just catch up for coffee and, you know, have lunch, whatever, you know, they're like, there's not many players in the world that can say they can do that with their head coach or a coach. Um, and that's, that's the, the beauty about the group, the coaching group that we have, that we had at the Chiefs that year is that with all those coaches, like um, Andrew Strawbridge, if I go back to Hamilton, I'm happy to go have a coffee and catch up with him or Tom Coventry, whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, it's just the, the people that they are, bro. It's um, made some really good, good, good people and yeah. good, great coaches. Yeah, it was- that brings us probably to our, our last point. What are the five key traits you believe a great leader should possess? So it's been really interesting actually listening to what you've been talking about there and, and some of Yeah, when you said up there, these Christians, I have to have a bit of time to, to reflect and, and to do a bit of uh, research on it. Um, I think I'll write them down, actually, so I don't not look like I'm an idiot. But no, no, um, That's why, yeah, because I, I want people to have a good... Uh, good thing about yeah, it. so I think uh, the five for me five key traits. It was hard to nail down five because there were so many that I, I think that are important. But um, I've done my best to, to nail down the best five that I believe that are important and um, that I try and live by every day. And it's um, that everyone should have a purpose and, and vision. Oh yeah, love it. Um, so everyone's having, and for me, it's obviously a bigger thing than rugby for my purpose and vision and. Um, so I think it's important that leaders have the have the team vision and, and purpose, but also have an individual purpose and, and vision for yourself. Yeah. Um, because in, if you live that and breed that, then you're going to be a better leader and, and a better person. So for me, my whole purpose about life is about giving back to others and helping others and, and serving other people and making sure that, that they are better. So me having that as a person, that just makes me a better leader as well. Yeah, I love it. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and definitely, that just sort of mate, flows into, into the team environment. Um, the second one, I, I thought I thought about this quite hard, is um, they need to sort of have a presence about them. So I look back about all the great coaches and great um, leaders and um, captains I've had, they all had a presence about them. They didn't walk into the room and say, hey, look at me. You just knew if they walked into the room that they, there was something about them. You know, They, had a, they were humble. There was um, a lot of manner about them. Um, they could... Couldn't, um, control. I don't know what's the word like. How do, how do, is is that something that like for you said working with a business or corporate leader that you need to have a presence about you or how does someone get that? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Um, maybe this is like way out there, but maybe it's like a, a inner spiritual thing. I don't. I'm not sure. Like if someone walked into a room and you know he was a proud man or proud woman or person. And you sort of could feel that you can yeah. feel their, their presence and their spirit in their on in Maori call it wairua. Like you could feel their their wairua. They're just there's something about them. Not saying that everybody great leaders need to have presence, but um, um like a confidence yeah, for me, I just think, about them. Yeah, 
but not, but not obviously not being cocky or not. Being, no, no, no. You know no, what no, I mean? Like no, still no. having the humility and the humbleness. Yes. Um. But like, even we've had like people come in, like you know what PDM that professional development thing is. Yep. We've had people come in that are great leaders in their community, but not without knowing their story. I could feel their spirit and their word yep. or that something was great about them. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, um. The third one. I think is uh, really important is um, the power to to be able to empower others and inspire others to be better. Yeah. So I personally don't believe that the the captain or the leader should be the best person in the team. I think the for me, I think the leader should be the the best people that can get the best out of other people and make them better. And not if that makes sense. Yep. 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 Yeah, so yeah, yeah. having the the ability to be that's able to sort of empower. a leader in itself, isn't it? Like the best player. Yeah. You said, like, Best player is not necessarily the captain, is it? Yeah, well, a lot of teams, like, not a lot of teams, but maybe yeah. younger high school teams or whatever, would always be the best player would be the captain or the guy yeah. that played for the... Like in our um, leadership group, you didn't have... Like, we had all blacks that went in the leadership group. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, just having that ability to empower and inspire others to, to be better. Yeah. Uh, the other one I think is really important is uh, to, ha- to be able to have an open mind and have a... A growth mindset. Yep. Yep. So not just being locked down on nah, being stubborn. This is the way. This is how we do it. Um, yep. I'll just. I think I know everything. I'm going to do it this way. I think having the ability to be able to be open to other ideas and listen to people, hear them out, because that's where most of the great answers come from is is through discussion. Yeah. Um, and it's okay to know that. So it's all right to not know that you don't know all the answers. You know what I mean? Yep. So yeah, I've played 179 games, but there might be an instance that. I don't know, it might be a guy that's played 20 odd games might have a better idea. Mm. So having that sort of a mindset of being able to have an open mindset to listen and, and to learn and to grow and just to develop yourself yeah. as well as a team. Um, so I, it's really important for me that you keep developing and growing as a person and, then, and as a player. I mean, that just like I said, just, just flows into the team and it flows into the environment if you look after your, yourself first. Um, and, and that's why I keep playing this game, bro. Because I keep learning, I keep growing, and I keep enjoying it. Um, and you got the, the day that I stop learning it. and growing, then then that's when I'm going to hang up the boots. While I'm 36 now, and I've still got the the passion and still got the the fire and hunger to keep learning and growing, bro. And, um, I take something away from every place I've been. So I've played in Japan and obviously here in Toulon. So I keep learning and understanding different ways. So um, it's yeah. been really enjoyable. Um, and the last one, I've talked about this before, and it's just. Um, living and breathing the values and standards that you believe as a, as a person and as a team um, and you just lead by actions and um, that's the the thing that I, I really got out of it because um, I think that's really important that you lead by your actions um, Ray Lewis is someone I really look up to as a leader and get great motivation from him and he talks about it's not what they hear it's what they see so yeah. Um, yeah. ever since I've been 16, 17, bro, that's how I've, I've led, um, I've, I've lived my life is by my actions. But as you get older and more comfortable in the role, then you start finding a voice and you start understanding that voice does play a big part and a, a, does play a big key. But I'm also really big on just making sure that I live and breathe um, the values and the standards, the purpose, the vision, um, and that I keep driving the, the actions and, and values and whatnot through, um, sorry, through my actions. Um, are you a Ravens fan? Oh, I'm not a Ravens fan, but I am a Ray Lewis fan. I'm a, I'm a Raiders fan. Oh, yeah. I've got you know, my Raiders cap is, yeah, the Raiders. Raider Nation. Excited for I'm not too sure about them moving to, to Las Vegas, but um, yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm a Raiders fan. Yeah, them and the Saints, that's who I go for. Very good. Liam Messam, um, thanks for that. It's been uh, very insightful and... Uh, Really excited about Dave Rennie and what he's going to bring to the Wallabies. So, um, as a, yeah, hopefully that does uh, equate to a bladder's low too. Yeah, it's it's pretty uh, it's, it's pretty scary when I saw he was going for the job and I was like, oh, please. I was like, oh, I'm happy for him that he got it because it's uh, the next level for him. But um, I know what he can achieve and what is possible for him. So it's uh, yeah, exciting times for Wallabies and a few Qs might be a bit nervous, I think. Yeah, thanks for your time. No worries, boy.